On this week's show, I'm joined by Dr. Cheryl McDonald, sports sociologist, and Stefan LeBlanc, NHL scout for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Cheryl, it's been a tremendous journey in sport for you. It really has. Definitely. Not maybe on the playing field at the university level, no. but from a scholar per perspective, your research, maybe just tell the folks at home your research and how groundbreaking it actually is. Sure. So I started off studying masculinity in ice hockey. I was into gender. Um, in the beginning and I was really into hockey and um, it seemed that the further I got, so starting around 2009, the further I got by 2012, the new thing we were talking about was homophobia. Um, and since then I've just sort of had my work laid out for me. Um, so I did my doctoral work in sociology looking at attitudes towards homosexuality in major midget AAA hockey. and. Um, from there, ended up getting a postdoc to sort of continue studying the same thing and to work with the You Can Play Project. So the You Can Play Project is um, the organization that was started by the Burke family after Brendan passed away in a car accident. So they've been closely tied to the NHL. Um, and so since then, I have been talking to former NHL players about their attitudes towards homosexuality. I have found a small handful of openly gay male elite hockey players to interview. Um, and I'm sort of doing a little bit of an online analysis right now, just sort of looking around Twitter to see how people are feeling about things like Ryan Getzlaff's comments and Andrew Shaw and whether or not the, the punishment was appropriate and things like that. Um, so it's been fun. I've been doing some research. I've been doing some activism. And um, I'm about to cap it all off and start something new. When did you know that that's what you wanted, that field, that that's what you wanted to do? I have two answers, so, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so when I was in my undergrad, I became very interested in gender because the individual that I was seeing at the time um, was playing men's hockey and coming from women's hockey 10 or 15 years ago. The two sports were very different. I hold that they're still very different, but at the time, things like hazing really weren't the same. Um, and of course, you know what we consider violence, so fighting. He did that and I didn't. And he was someone who really didn't like fighting and didn't like rookieing and things like that, but he did them anyway um, to fit in. So I became very interested in why our experiences were so different um, and started going from there. However, the homophobia thing, it's one of my favorite stories to tell because I ended up getting a phone call with George Laroque and um, just for, you know, because I had him on the phone, I said, I'm looking for something to study for four years that has to do with masculinity and ice hockey. If you had to choose, what would it be? And he said, you need to find out why it's not okay to be gay. And he said, you need to talk wow. to the young ones. You need to go to midget. You need to go to junior. And he said, you know, there are gay men in the NHL, and either they're not out or their teammates are keeping their secret, and you need to find out why that is. And so not so much because it was an interest of mine, but because I believed it was important. Because that same year that I had that conversation with him, the You Can Play project started. So I knew I was on to something. Um, and so it... It was interesting because emotionally I was more removed from the subject and I think it was easier for me to look at it than trying to figure out my own relationship and, and fighting and rookieing. Um, but yeah, it just, um, it, it was sort of the craze or the buzzword or what have you and so I knew I had something important ahead of me that was going to give me uh, a lot of work to do and at the same time it has become more meaningful to me now and that's why I do the activism thing and I, I have actually found a passion in it. How difficult what is it walking in, first of all, getting the coach's permission, the parents on board, and then walking into a team atmosphere of adolescent boys that aspire to be professional, and there's that unwritten code. Maybe talk about the difficulty entering that, that world and then the code. Of course. So that's interesting because... When, you know, especially in academia, when we talk about sexism, we often end up talking about homophobia, and the two are sort of intertwined. And so there's not only the fact that I'm a woman going into a male-dominated space, but there's, you know, the, the sort of homonegative or anti-gay aspect to it all as well. 
And so first I'm an outsider, so they need to accept me on that basis. And then I'm dealing with a difficult subject. Um, and I find as time goes by, I'm received differently. And now certainly, you know, I have contacts in the hockey world um, who have sort of explained to people that I'm not so terrible, <laughs> I can be let in. Um, and I mean, I've also made my own name a little bit as time has gone by and people have gotten to know me and, and I don't seem to scare anyone too much. Um, however, what I'm finding is that it's quite divided. Um, you know, people are way more open-minded now than they might have been five and ten years ago. Um, but at the same time, you know, especially when it comes to parents, there are some parents who say, A, I don't want my kid to have to deal with this, and B, what does that have to do with hockey? Um, and then there are parents who say, no, this is absolutely necessary. Thank goodness somebody's coming in to talk to our kids about this because we don't even know how. Um, so it can be quite divided. And um, I also find that the, the kids are struggling with it themselves, certainly the young ones, when I speak to them one-on-one -on -one in our interviews. Um, either they actually don't have a problem with homosexuality or they're very cognizant of the fact that they've developed their opinions from other friends, from family members. I had one who said, well, my father told me it's wrong, so it's wrong. Um, I've had others who said, you know, I live in a community of 200 people. I've never seen a gay person, let alone a trans person, so I don't know what to do with that. No, I'm not just okay with it. Um, and then, of course, there are the ones that, you know, they're, they're in sort of, sort of metropolitan cities. Their parents have gay friends or they have family members who identify as LGBT, and they're quite fine with it. Um, their biggest concern is being naked in the shower with a gay teammate, and they sort of seem to assume that an openly gay teammate would be attracted to them by virtue of seeing them naked, which, um, I mean, I know that wouldn't be the case for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, it's just, it's the unknown that scares yeah. them. And, and I think that's like anybody else. So I think the more that, that um, they let me in and other people in, and the more we have conversations, and the more visibility you get of the LGBT community on TV, or on the internet, what have you, um, the more accepting society is going to be. Well, you, you talk about that acceptance. This is not just a hockey problem, Cheryl. No, I mean, I feel like hockey's perhaps lagging behind a little bit. There's research that shows that when social change occurs, the, the male sporting world is a little bit behind every time. Um, but that's certainly not to, to point the finger and say that this is the only place left where it's happening and it's the absolute worst. It's, you know, it, sports is a microcosm of society and, and hockey may be behind, of course, but um, it's not the only place where we need to be doing work. Did you ever think you'd have the impact on sport that you have already had in, in your short time? That's tough, because I, I often wake up feeling like I haven't done much. Um, so I, I take that as a compliment that you asked the question. <laughs> um, but I mean, no, I, I never really thought that. I wanted to be a university professor and, and teach young people to learn. And I feel like I'm doing that, but I never thought, um, you know, for instance, last summer I got to coordinate um, our contingent in pride parades across the country for you can play in the Canadian Olympic Committee. Did I ever think I was going to wake up and, and sort of like be in a parade with Eddie Lack? No, <laughs> I never <laughs> did. Um, so that's definitely been very cool. Yeah. You, your experience outside the atmosphere of sport, but you go behind the scenes and you've talked to some great NHL players why is it so tough for them not to talk about what's happening in the game right now and or what what they've experienced in as they they're coming up when they were players right so i mean yeah i've spoken to some hall of famers who would never reveal their names or that they've spoken to me um and it it's it circles right back to the conversation that I had with my partner 10 or 15 years ago. It's just easier to fit in. It's easier to keep quiet. And I think there's this understanding that hockey players are supposed to be very quiet, very humble. Um, when you think about the Connor McDavid's and Sidney Crosby's, that's sort of who we think hockey players should be. Um, and so the word that always comes up is a distraction. And what I found in my interviews is whether you're concussed, whether you've been sexually abused, whether you're gay, whether you've got mental health issues, you're a distraction to the team and there's always somebody who's probably just as good at hockey as you are waiting to take your job. 
And so it's just easier to stay quiet. And in order to be the right kind of hockey player, you keep your mouth shut and you stay out of the politics. And I think that that mentality follows them outside of the game, which is why I'm having conversations with, you know, I, I can think of one player who spent, I think, 18 seasons in the NHL. He's in the Hall of Fame. He thinks it's very important to be talking to me about this, and he's got, you know, very progressive opinions on the subject. Um, but he'd rather sort of keep his name and his identity out of it because hockey players shouldn't be in the spotlight. And he certainly doesn't want to be a figurehead and be in the media and have all of these opinions. Um, he thinks it's his job to, to stay out of it. What, when you sit down with these these Hall of Famers, it, Cheryl, like you're, you're, it's a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Not too many people have that opportunity, and then your line of questioning is right to the point. And you mentioned mental health. A lot of these players tra that transition out of the game have dealt with mental health issues and now are, are revealing those issues and, and are okay with talking. How is that? That has to be difficult to hear their stories. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, I can, I can think of, I had a, a midget AAA player who had dealt with cancer in his family and death and, and was in tears during our interview uh, and made very clear that I was not to reveal any of that, certainly not his name. Um, because he would never be accepted by his peers. And I think what's starting to happen is the more that the younger players realize that it's okay to not be okay, um, the more they want to use their voices. So I have one of my interviewees who played in the NHL in the early 2000s um, who suffered a whole pile of mental health issues that weren't necessarily dealt with or dealt with properly when he played pro. But now that he's on the other side, he sees that there are so many people who struggled like him and that it's okay to struggle and that maybe if they got help, they'd be better players. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of what it comes down to is, yeah, hockey has the potential to create better people, but when you're at that level, winning is a big deal and getting paid is a big deal. And if we are to accept that that's what it's about, then you want a healthy and happy player because then they're able to perform. Um, so I, you know, I think as the younger ones move up, they better understand the importance of being happy and healthy. Um, and they're more willing, some of them, to speak up and make sure that the younger ones understand that. And I think that's awesome. I'm often asked what the main problem is in hockey because certainly you know, there, there are people who aren't open-minded and aren't accepting and, and what have you. And when you look at sort of you know, the GM level and up in the NHL, it's a bunch of old white men and you're not gonna change their minds on homosexuality. And I don't expect to. When you're that old, you've made up your mind about a lot of things in the world, and the world was different when you were my age. Um, and I understand that, but to me, that means we need to start working on the younger ones. Right. What's next for you? Where, where is your journey in, in sport taking you? Uh, I am off to St. Mary's University. I have a second postdoctoral <laughs> position there. This time funded federally by the government. Um, so I'll be doing research. I'm not entirely sure on what just yet. I need to talk to my supervisors about that. It'll be something to do with mental health and gender and sexuality. It always is. Uh, and I'll be teaching a little bit. Um, St. Mary's in the last couple of years has um, started the Center for the Study of Sport and Health, um, where they're trying to tie together academics and athletics a bit more. So I'm <laughs> a perfect fit. <laughs> Um, so I'm off to St. Mary's for two years, maybe more, if everything works out and I'll do more research and more teaching. I think I'll be toning down the activism a little bit. There came a point where I started missing the academic side um, and I, I sort of got back to that original goal that I told you about, which sort of was teaching and working with athletes to teach them to learn. Um, so I'll still continue to do my workshops with teams. if people want me to come in to teach their athletes, um, absolutely. But being back on a university campus and, and focusing my energy there is sort of what I'm getting excited about doing. Well, you do groundbreaking work and continued success in everything that you've, you do uh, moving forward, but your work in the game of hockey is truly outstanding. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Cheryl, for coming in today. Thank you for having me.
Stefan, you've had a unique journey in the in the game of hockey. What impact has your journey had on you personally? And did you ever think you'd get to the NHL? Well, for a long <laughs> time, I, I didn't think I would. I mean, when when we're little kids, we all think we're going to play in the NHL, but reality set in quickly enough and uh, uh, never became a professional hockey player. But as I get into teaching and coaching, I realized how much I was passionate about the game of hockey. And it was really something that I, I wanted to do more and more. And I never really aspired to be working in the NHL, but I always wanted to do it at the highest level possible. And I guess uh, the NHL would imply that. Um, and so uh, I, w I was fortunate enough that I worked with some really good people and, and had some opportunities. And uh, um, I would just say what it's done for me personally is it's made me a very happy person. Um, when you get to do a job that you love, um, you know, I, I love getting up in the morning and saying, okay, today I'm, I got to do my reports from last night and get on the road and go to another hockey game. And for some people that might sound uh, like a job, but for me that's fun. And so uh, on a personal level, it's, it's, it's made my life very happy and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a job that I really enjoy. The, the passion from teaching and, and how many years were you in education? Uh, 16 years. 16 years in education. That passion and then that same passion transcends into the game of hockey. You're behind the bench. You're a very successful uh, program at LJR, provincial, you know, like at, at that level. But it was a phone call from Jim Midgley, really, that kind of got the ball rolling. Yeah. Um, and and you know, summer summer coaching hockey, New Brunswick. Yeah. Talk about that phone call. Well, I guess um, when I get into coaching, uh, I really enjoyed it, and I decided to get involved with hockey, New Brunswick, and hockey Canada programs. And I get to work with Jim Midgley, who was a uh, an assistant coach with the St. John Sea Dogs at the time, and uh, in working. With, in those programs, we evaluate players, so we discuss players uh, or at the games and around the table. And so um, from working with him, they needed a scout in St. John, and he gave me a call and asked me if I'd, if I'd like to do some scouting. And that was something that I'd sort of, uh, I was sort of starting to get away from coaching and, and wanting to do something else, and scouting seemed like something I'd like to do. And so I got the opportunity to start with St. John, and uh, I was lucky that I got to work with some tremendous people. Uh, Norm Gosselin, who was my head scout at the time, uh, went on to scout for the Phoenix Coyotes, um, sort of took me under his wing and, and guided me in my first couple years. Um, then I worked with Chris Vermette, who, uh, you know, he, he gave me more and more responsibility on the, on the scouting staff, and that, and that uh, really helped my development out as a scout. I uh, got to work with Gerard Gallant and Mike Kelly, who uh, you know had both worked in the NHL already, and they're 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 uh, they're back in the NHL in Vegas now. But they helped us all out because they gave us they showed a lot of confidence in us. And whatever we said, or if we recommend, recommended a player, they would stay out of it and trust us. And uh, the re the results were positive. But when people like that trust you, it it helps your confidence in your ability to to scout players. And uh, you know, I think from our staff, uh, I think uh, three of us went on to scout in the NHL. A couple other guys are head scouts in the queue. So we just we had a really good scouting staff, and I was fortunate enough to come in there at that time, and got to learn from all these people. And so I think that that helped my career along in the scout in in, in my scouting career for sure. The journey from having aspirations of playing to having those aspirations of coaching. Then you land in St. John, as you just mentioned, during the heyday of the St. John Sea Dogs, an expansion franchise, really, mm -hmm. that started from the ground up. And you're part of two presidents, you know, like President's Cup and a Memorial Cup. Steph, that doesn't happen by, by chance. That's people out in the ranks and, and scouting, and, and those young players had impacts. Yeah, absolutely, but I, I also think that you, 
you, you have to do things well, but you also have to be lucky too. <laughs> and I, I got in there at the right time, yeah. and uh, we had a lot of success. And I think from team success, you know, it opens opportunities for individuals. And so, um, you know, I never went into it thinking, well, I got to go to the rink because it's going to help me get an NHL job one day. Right. You go to the rink and you do the work and you do the phone calls and talk about it because you want to make your team better. Right. And if you're doing it for that reason because you're, you, you know, you're working for this team and you're part of the team and you want to help the team and you're doing it for the right reasons, uh, I think you're going to do your job better. And if you do your job better, um, you know, if you're, you're looking for opportunities, they will come. And if you feel wanted as well. Absolutely. And when, and when you have NHL coaches like Turk and, and, and Mike at the helm and, and they're giving confidence, that... It does that, help, yeah. Because I think as a scout, there's one thing you have to do is you have to trust yourself. You have to trust your own opinion. If you're hired by a team or, or, or an organization, it's because um, somebody somewhere saw something, a talent, in you that you have at evaluating players. So yeah. if you if you want to do a good job, you have to trust your instincts. And and working with all these people helped me to, to gain the confidence and say, well, I'm gonna go and I'm I'm gonna identify the players that I like for my team and, and hopefully hopefully they'll learn <laughs> out. You mentioned that trust factor. When you walk into a rink, Steph, what are you evaluating? Especially in, in this day and age from the junior ranks, and anyway, we're not gonna get to the NHL ranks yet, but when you were scouting for the Q, what did you look for? Well, there's all these, uh, these skills, the skating, the shooting, uh, can the guy score, can he defend? Those are one thing, but I think you gotta go with the players that when you see them, they light something inside of you. Yeah. And you say, geez, I like that player. And when you find those guys, those are the guys you got to fight for because if you saw something in them that you think, you know, you know, you see a guy and you say, I'd like to have him on my team. Whether it's his character, his hard work, uh, the guy's hockey sense, you see something in him that you really want on your team. And you have to trust that. One example, during your St. John days. I guess the best example was Jonathan Huberdeau. Um, we went up there for the Challenge. I guess it's the, the Gatorade combine now, yeah. but it used to be the challenge. And I saw this skinny little kid about 5'11", skating around the ice and making all these incredible plays. And to me, his hockey sense was unbelievable. His vision was unbelievable. Just the way the things that he did. Um, and he ended up, he wasn't ranked that high, but at that tournament was my first viewing of him and he yeah. really caught my eye. And he ended up being a, a, a superstar in the queue and went on to a good NHL career. But he was the one guy, probably the first guy, where I saw something special that, you know, I said, wow, I want this guy <laughs> on my team. Yeah. And, and uh, he was probably the first guy that I felt it. And, and when you feel that with a player, I think you have to trust it. Yeah. Ross Yates, how important has Ross been? to your NHL career and, and getting that started. Yes, well, Ross uh, came to work with us in St. John the last few years that I was there. And um, there was some changes in St. John and I was no longer with them. And uh, Ross had worked for the Columbus Blue Jackets for about 10 years in the AHL. And so their head scout, uh, Paul Castron, gave him a call in the summer. He said, I need a guy in the Maritimes. <laughs> and uh, having worked with Ross for a few years and he knew that I was probably looking for a hockey job, um, gave my name, and uh, that's how I got on with Columbus. And uh, so I was very fortunate, and I, I'm very grateful towards Ross for, for mentioning my name. But a lot of times, uh, the people you work with end up helping you out in the long run. So you know, you, uh, if you're going to scout or coach or do any kind of work, you got to be mindful of, of your work ethic, uh, being respectful of others that you work with and being somebody that, that people want to work with because they might end up opening some doors for you in the, fu in the future. Your journey, Steph, has been very memorable to date and it's still going on. We wish you all the, uh, the best with uh, Columbus uh, and uh, your scouting endeavors uh, in the NHL. Living the dream, Steph Olivon. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thanks for having me.